The 6 o'clock news starts right now. With record numbers of COVID-19 cases hitting El Paso, hospitals are at full capacity there. And now hit by snow and ice flights out of El Paso with intensive care unit patients heading to hospitals across the state. Expected to resume as soon as the weather clears. Tonight, more information from STRAC, the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council that's coordinating this statewide effort. Jesse Degollado tells us the San Antonio-based agency is doing what it calls load balancing to relieve the intensive care units in that border community. Specially equipped aircraft with trained medical crews will fly critically ill patients out of El Paso to many of the major Texas cities now poised to accept patients from its overburdened intensive care units. The difference between a really busy, busy day in the ICU and being overwhelmed can sometimes just be two or three patients in your unit. So that's what we're trying to help them do right now. Any guess how many may be coming ultimately to San Antonio and elsewhere? How many might be coming overall or even here in San Antonio? I think it's hard to say exactly how many in, in El Paso we might eventually move. You know, our goal is to get to 15 or 20 a day. But he says not all at one time, rather maybe two or three per city as long as needed. Some being COVID patients or, he says, others who may need to be on respirators for an extended period of time. Really, it's the choice of the sending hospital to pick which will help them the most with their capability and capacity. San Antonio was in much the same predicament last summer. Even with the slow rise in hospitalizations here and many children back in school and with Halloween ahead, he says it's still possible to avoid becoming another El Paso. I think our efforts that we're doing in the community are working and we need to continue those if we want to stay where the healthcare system doesn't become overwhelmed. It's not hard. It's just tiring. And if we can stick through it and stay uh, on the right path, I think we're going to do great. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The Bear County Sheriff's Office recovering multiple stolen vehicles out of a suspected chop shop today. The deputies called out to the 10,600 block of Old Pearsall Road based on a tip of a possible stolen vehicle there. Sheriff Javier Salazar says what they found was 90 to $100,000 worth of stolen materials. That included nine trucks, a trailer, miscellaneous stolen parts. No arrests were made today. Salazar says they believe the chop shop is part of a larger, larger organization. San Antonio police still looking for those responsible for a violent robbery at an apartment on the city's west side. Police say the suspects broke into the victim's apartment in the 12,000 block of Vera Cruz just after 2 this morning. Officers say the victim told them the suspects tied him up with zip ties and pistol whipped him before shooting him. The victim says they made off with his TV, several other belongings as well. The man was eventually able to run out of his apartment and call for help. He was taken to a hospital and is expected to be okay. A north side man says someone has been less than neighborly to him and his family. He says his home has been the target of a series of attacks, vandalism, that now has him fearing for their safety. Katrina Weber shows us why he wants police to investigate this as a hate crime. When he decided to put his political pride on display earlier this month, Tom Cox never imagined he'd get such a reaction. It just it makes me nervous. My husband and I have been together going on 31 years. So we've lived through a lot together. He says this time they're being targeted by someone with criminal intentions. Their home in the Oak Hollow Park subdivision and the signs out front have been hit three times this month by someone with spray paint. Messages that seem more and more threatening. He showed us pictures, how they started out political, but then turned personal. The last few telling them to leave. Straight up noon is when the ring camera caught the guy. He came in, hit the signs again, and then the garage door. The most recent episode happened last Friday in broad daylight. His doorbell camera captured a man with his face covered, tagging his garage. This has been disturbing and the fact that it's escalating and he's getting right up to the house. Cox says he can't help but believe that this is about more than just his politics. He suspects that that rainbow flag and what it represents may be the real reason for the person's anger. He says he considers this a hate crime and reported it to San Antonio police who are still investigating. I just want him caught and I want him punished and I want it to stop. Cox is hoping that happens before anyone gets hurt. Yeah. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News.
You've probably seen a lot of political ads featuring these two incumbent Republican Senator John Cornyn and Democratic political newcomer MJ Hagar. It's a heated race to keep an eye on. So we asked both candidates the top issues they've been talking about. Courtney Friedman brings us their answers. U.S. Senator John Cornyn has held his position as a U.S. Senator for Texas since 2002. This election, he's campaigning hard against U.S. Air Force veteran and teacher MJ Hagar. This is the strangest election uh, season that I've ever experienced. That in great part due to COVID-19, which has pushed both candidates to label health care as a priority. Frankly, we had a health care crisis in Texas before the pandemic. And so that's why I'm fighting for a public option for people to have access to that care while also fighting to make sure that we preserve every Texan's right to choose what that access to affordable quality health care means for them. Everyone in Congress believes that we ought to cover pre-existing conditions. Their argument is the only way you could do it is through the Affordable Care Act, and that's not true either. Keeping costs down has proven to be a difficult both candidates also commented on the most recent controversy, Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who was sworn in last night. I didn't see any reason to delay. Um, there was nothing, there were no rules broken. I know our Democratic colleagues were disappointed, uh, but um, that's the way it goes. I feel like I would have respected this process a lot more if they had just owned it and said, yeah, we didn't really mean that it was an election year, so we can't confirm a nominee. In the end, the candidates did have one same message for the public get out and vote. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. It is one of a kind, Mexican candy. South Texans, no strangers to the spicy, sweet, sometimes sour flavored candies. But it seems the popularity of Mexican candy is growing. You're seeing it in places outside, just candy shops. That's the topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. And today as a preview, we're introducing you to two local stores that say their business is booming. Mexican candy. It's hard to describe the flavor in just one word. In my experience, yeah. Mm, Diego Venado and his wife Brenda are the owners of La Dulceria on Bassi and Blanco Road. He recalls the first day they opened three years ago. La gente entraba y decía, Esto hacía falta aquí. The business has done so well, they opened a second location in Austin. Muchos clientes vienen acá específicamente a, 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 porque saben que aquí encuentran un sabor, un, un dulce que no encuentran en ningún otro lado. All of his candy is imported from Mexico, so you're getting the real deal. Volverles a traer esos sabores que recuerdan para acá. He also carries the traditional Mexican candies, palanquetas de cacahuate, cocadas, mazepanes. Muy, muy ricas. Buenas tardes. Chamoy is a popular ingredient in Mexican candy. It's also a staple in mangonadas. Most of the people say this is the best mangonada that they tried before. Mangonadas are the number one seller at Las Mangonadas Ice Cream Shop at the corner of Calabra Road and San Joaquin Avenue. They're made with real mango, which is what customers say sets this place apart from others. It's real good. Porque es refrescante y es un poco picosito. Juan Torrijos is the owner of this shop. He makes everything fresh in the morning. Tenemos 25 clases de nieves, 40 clases de paletas y 10 clases de aguas frescas. His four-year-old daughter is his official taste tester, so you know they only serve what's good. Come and enjoy our mangonadas and our ice cream. And you know we had to try all this stuff in the process. Of course. Right? This was a tough project, yes. really. KSAT explains Mexican candy, the craze behind it that will be available to start streaming Thursday on the KSAT TV app. You can find that on Roku, Fire Stick, most other streaming devices. I'm just glad the KSAT explains team was able to really sink their teeth into this one. And boy, did we ever. All right, I-35 at Randolph. No major trouble just to tell you about. Except maybe the weather, it is chilly, so hope the heater's working in the car. It's amazing, it's 43 degrees yeah. outside right now. I went home yesterday and I, I was like, oh, I asked my husband, oh, what are you cooking? It smells a little like something burnt. He said, sir, that's the heater yeah. <laughs> for the first time. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a little while. Uh, and yeah, it's been a very cold day all day long. Temperature only budging a few degrees. I wanna show you the time lapse and you can see the, uh, pieces of drizzle there on the uh, time lapse camera. High temperature today was only 45 degrees in our low 43. So again, we only 
went up about two degrees and all that drizzle it only amounted to two hundredths of an inch of rainfall at the airport. Now there is some hope for a little bit more rain later on tonight, especially from midnight onward, and it should be a little more substantial than just the drizzle that we've been seeing, but temperatures nearly 30 degrees cooler than seasonably average outside right now. 38 in Bandera, 37 at Bernie Stage Airfield, 37 in Kerrville, 43 in Hondo, 44 at Stinson, 44 in New Braunfels. A wider view here, 34 in Rock Springs. Rock Springs actually saw its first freeze of the season and, and temperatures will probably not get below freezing up in the hill country, so I wouldn't worry about that. It is windy, however. Winds are still holding steady from the north at about 10 to 20 miles per hour. And as a result, we do have a wind chill. Wind chill values in the 30s everywhere you look, so it's a chilly evening. Now this evening, temperatures will hang out right around 43 and we'll see scattered light rain after midnight. Now coming up after the break, I've got your spooky Halloween forecast. All right, we're just a few seconds away from today's coronavirus update. It'll be interesting to see if we're seeing the surge that they're seeing in other parts of the state and the country. Also want to mention today is Judge Nelson Wolf's birthday. We'll see if that's mentioned. <laughs> Let's go live to City Hall. Turned 80 today. Happy birthday, Judge. We're also welcomed uh, by Jennifer Harriet, who's the Assistant Director of Metro Health. Jennifer oversees the Community Health Division, which includes the Healthy Neighborhoods and Healthy Corner Stores initiatives and the city's SA Kids Breathe Asthma Prevention Program. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we are reporting 174 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our cumulative total to 64,941 since the pandemic began. The seven day moving average is now at 192. Fortunately, we do have no new deaths to report tonight. Uh, please do keep your, our, friend, our friends and family and neighbors in your prayers this evening as many in our community have lost loved ones throughout the course of this pandemic. Tonight in our hospitals, there are 238 COVID patients in the hospital, which is down 10 from yesterday, including 29 new new COVID-19 related missions in the last 24 hours. We have 89 patients in the ICU and 46 patients on ventilators this evening. Let me turn it over now to Commissioner Wolf. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks for uh, mentioning the judge's birthday. Yes, he, he is 80 years old, so you'll see myself and Commissioner Rodriguez sort of filling in for him this week so he can take a little time off, but uh, happy birthday to Dad. Uh, I just wanted to bring up real quick, uh, not often do we get to say nice things about the jail. Uh, however, we do 100% testing uh, as we get new entrants into our jail, and we have found that their uh, rate is down all the way down to 2%, uh, which has been obviously really good. Uh, hopefully that will be reflective of the greater population as a whole, uh, but uh, I want to give a shout out to the sheriff and to the university hospital system who have been doing that 100% testing, whether people are showing symptoms or not. So it's, it's turning out uh, to give us some really good numbers. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I'm, again, happy to report uh, you. Uh, we discussed uh, this week or yesterday uh, the Pre-K for East, uh, Pre-K for SA East uh, Center that had uh, a few of their teachers come back positive and one student positive. All of the students and all of the staff have now been tested and there have been no new additional positives as a result of those community labs tests. Uh, so we're very grateful for that and also shows the importance of us doing the rapid testing of those populations when we do see an indication of an infection. And that's a further reminder, if you do have symptoms, uh, if you feel ill, don't take it for granted. Don't go to work. If you feel ill, make sure you get tested. We've got testing sites set up throughout the community uh, for that very purpose, and we want to make sure that we get a handle on infections before they spread. Do want to make mention that we've got assistance programs ready to help you if you are struggling through this pandemic. We have an emergency housing assistance program if you're struggling to pay rent or mortgage, uh, that program is available to you. Simply call 311 or you can go to the website at covid19.sanantonio.gov. All right, wrapping up today's daily briefing, no new deaths to report, which is, of course, a good thing. And that's something we've seen for several days in yep. a row now. Uh, 174 new cases reported since yesterday. Uh, that number, that seven-day moving average, that stands at about 192 cases on average every 24 hours, something that the mayor and city officials continue to watch. Yeah, and Commissioner Kevin Wolf in for Judge Nelson Wolf, who is 
enjoying his birthday week, and apparently that'll happen for the rest of the week. He and Commissioner Justin Rodriguez will be filling in. He pointed out the positivity rate at the jail, which is actually pretty remarkable. Just 2% of people tested at the jail are testing positive. Uh, that's way lower than the city's rate right now. Uh, so that's some good news from the Bear County Jail. He gave credit to the jail staff itself as well as University Health System. Let's turn now to the weather out there. 43 degrees. A lot of people, I would think, enjoying the cooler temperatures. It is Perhaps from indoors. Yeah, from <laughs> indoors. It's a welcome change. You know, we've been very toasty over the last few days, and now we're chilly. It is 43 out there, and because of an upper-level low-pressure system uh, to our west, we're going to actually see a chance for some light rain tonight, more substantial than what we've been seeing throughout the day today, which is really just drizzle. And by the start of the day tomorrow, Tomorrow, 7 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, we're going to be chilly. 43 here in San Antonio. Temperatures keeping steady. It'll be in the 30s up in the Hill Country. 33 Rock Springs, 36 for the morning loan. Kerrville, 39 in Del Rio. Neighborhood view here, it'll be 42 at JBSA Randolph, 42 in New Braunfels, 39 in Timberwood Park, and 39 up in Bernie. Uh, and then throughout the day, we're actually going to warm up really nicely. It'll be 66 degrees in downtown San Antonio for the afternoon high. The reason for that, skies are actually going to to clear in the morning and by the afternoon it'll be totally sunny. We'll have northwest winds at 10 to 15 miles per hour with gusts up to 20 miles per hour. So it'll be a breezy too. And then in the week ahead, chilly mornings and comfortable afternoons near 70 degrees. So promise you that Halloween sneak peek had to bring out the dancing mummy and we're going to be looking at temperatures Halloween evening, Saturday evening in the 60s. It'll be clear and cool. And again, I promise you a very fall like forecast. So mornings in the 40s, afternoons in the 70s, low humidity. So after we get through the chilly evening, we're going to be rewarded with some really pleasant weather. Not really going to need that AC in the extended future. So that's pretty nice. <laughs> Do you ever notice you never see Adam Kasky and the dancing mummy in the same place? Why not? I'm just, maybe there's <laughs> the same person. Okay. Some well, of those dance moves look, look familiar. That. <laughs> does have bandages all over himself. So. <laughs> Thermometer making can be dangerous. There you go. All right. This guy has been fantastic for the Roadrunners, and it kind of makes you wonder why he chose them. Well, it's interesting. We knew how good he was back when he played for Judson, yeah. now that it's transferred to UTSA, but he had offers from other Division I schools, so why did he choose UTSA? We will ask the nation's leading rusher when we come back. And the last time the Longhorns brought their A game, we'll put that question to their head coach coming up. Former Justin, now UTSA running back, Sincere McCormick has been named the Earl Campbell Tyler Rose Player of the Week following his incredible performance in the Roadrunners' 27-26 victory over Louisiana Tech to snap a three-game losing streak and improve the Roadrunners' conference USA record to 2-1. and one. McCormick registered his second straight and fourth overall this season, 100-yard performance to go along with his three touchdowns that also earned him Conference USA Offensive Player of the Week. His 165 yards is only topped by his school record 37 carries. It's more carries than even the pros get in a single game, so why did the leading rusher in the nation pick UTSA over other Division One schools. I felt like you know being home, no matter you know they always talk about go to these big name schools, but it doesn't really matter what school you go to. It's just what if you can make a name for yourself and knowing that you can make a, uh, make a name for yourself. And coming into you know UTSA with Rashad is, and we had that that uh, that bond already, just knowing that I have him on my side, and we know that there's the purpose and the goal, the ultimate goal is to get you know UTSA on on the map, and that's our that's our objective, especially with having uh, Frank Harris, uh, uh, Spencer, and uh, all the other guys from the 210, and being here and establishing grounds that. You you know, we could just make it, make it, especially with uh, UTSA being like pretty much the only football because San Antonio doesn't have a, a NFL football team. And Sincere's motto, all gas, no brakes. We'll see it again when the Roadrunners travel to Boca Raton to face Florida Atlantic Saturday at 11 a.m. For the first time since the fight in Texas Aggies got into the SEC in 2012, they'll play Arkansas at Kyle Field. Since that time, the two rivals will go back 117 years have been facing off an AT&T Stadium in Arlington. The last three contests decided by seven points or less. Now the Aggies will extend their win streak over the Razorbacks. This is definitely one of the games that um, that has always been kind of close, and um, you know we've won the the last eight times, but uh, you know we're not we're not trying to slip up this time. And um, like I said, it's going to take a great week of practice and um, detail and focus and. Um, 
but you know I think we'll be ready. Kickoff between the Aggies and the Razorbacks in College Station on Saturday is set for 6.30 p.m. The Texas Longhorns will be faced with their toughest challenge of the season when they travel to Stillwater to face the undefeated and six-ranked Oklahoma State Cowboys. That's after the Longhorns are able to hold off Baylor 27-16 for their first win after back-to-back -back losses to TCU and Oklahoma, while Oklahoma State barely beat Iowa State 24-21. In his weekly press conference, head coach Tom Herman was asked, when is the last time he saw his team bring their A game? Well, we haven't yet this year, uh, that's for sure. Um, probably in all phases, the, the Alamo Bowl, would, you know, to answer your question, but uh, we've got it in us. I, I, I know we do, and, you know, we've been building towards it for sure. I, I think, you know, we continue to improve uh, as the season goes on. So I, I think we're headed towards our, our A game and and hopefully we can uh, show up and, and deliver our A game in Stillwater because we're, we're going to need it. <laughs> yes, they will. Kickoff in Stillwater is set for 3 p.m. The Cowboys make a tree. But first, let's listen to this. Tonight is the night the Los Angeles Dodgers can win their first World Series since 1988 with a win over Tampa Bay or the Rays can force a winner take all game seven. Batter up is at 7.05. And back to that, Cowboys do make a tree. We have all the details coming up tonight on the night beat. All right. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. Just a few days left of early voting and a few days more until Election Day. We're seeing some record numbers here in Bear County across Texas and really the rest of the nation. We want to bring in somebody who's been looking at those numbers. Ferris Sabawi, a member of our own digital team, our own digital journalist. Ferris, nice to see you. It's been a couple of months since we've seen you in person. Hello, virtually. Uh, tell us what you're looking at when it comes to the numbers here locally. What stands out to you? Yeah, so we're seeing, um, you know, just a really big turnout during the early voting so far. Um, that's been something that's been really interesting to us uh, already. Uh, especially because of the extra week of early voting, we've seen more than 543,000 people come out in Bexar County to cast the ballot. That's already 45% um, of registered voters. Uh, so that's a really, really good sign. Uh, one thing we're really interested in is to see if the turnout percentage wise is higher than 2016. Of course, we expect the sheer number of votes to be higher than 2016 because this, this county has had so much growth. But the interesting thing we're looking at is will turnout just, uh, you know, as a percentage be higher than four years ago. A lot of talk about the youth vote out there, and I've appreciated what how you've crunched the numbers on our website. But a lot of talk about the youth vote out there. Are we seeing the youth vote that appears to be turning out statewide turning out in Bear County or is there a way to determine that? So Bear County does not keep uh, demographic data like that. Their elections department um, doesn't keep it on hand. Uh, anecdotally, we've seen a lot more young people come out. Uh, but statewide, Steve, like you said, we've already seen six times the turnout um, at this point last year. Uh, when you when you look at um, uh, Circle, which is a research organization from Tufts University, they've been looking into youth voter turnout quite a bit. And, uh, you know, they had found that already 753,000 voters under 30 have already cast a vote in this 2020 election compared to the same time uh, in 2016 with 11 days ahead of the election. Only 106,000 had casted a vote uh, in 2016. So uh, the youth vote is definitely up, and I'm pretty sure Bayer County is a part of it. We've, we've seen it um, in other counties as well, and uh, I'm really interested to see where that number ends up, voters under 30. In 2016, uh, they only made up less than a third of the voters uh, in the presidential election. I'm interested to see if they're going to take up a bigger piece of that pie. There are so many interesting ways to look at these numbers. Yes, we do have, as you said, the, the record number of registered voters in Bear County, but we're seeing a record turnout already as well. So are those two linked? Is it just more of an interest, more people being energized? Uh, but I, I know that you have actually put a guide out there for the people who have not voted yet. I think a lot of people would argue, well, there's not many undecideds left given those big numbers, but they're out there. So uh, you have a voter's guide people can access on our website. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so uh, it was actually uh, my colleague, Julie Moreno, but we put together this really uh, fantastic uh, procrastinator's guide to voting if you <laughs> haven't done so already. Um, and what's really cool about this uh, that, that I like is uh, we, you know, we've put every piece of information in there that, that you could use. Um, and so part of it is, um, you know, make, making sure you're registered, uh, what, what you can't wear to the polls, like uh, any campaign gear or things like that uh, but we also have uh, a voting guide that you can um we have links to voting guides that you can go check out and we also have uh, our own coverage on every big race that you're gonna see if you live in bear county on that ballot so uh what i love about that is uh we're not just telling you to go out there and it's not too late and, and head to the polls but we actually give you a chance to uh, look at the voter guide, read our coverage, learn more about these candidates before you make it out there. And you can still early vote until Friday. So there's still a couple of days. If you wanna simmer on that, read some of that stuff, come back to it the next day. Maybe uh, maybe you wanna sleep on it and, and come back and that's fine too. You know, I'm a political geek. You know that you've worked in the newsroom yeah. with me long enough. Uh, election night to me, the live stream we do is kind of like Wayne's world, like we could do it in my base, my mom's basement. Uh, talk about the numbers that we've talked about and what that shows you. Is there a conclusion that you can come to or that you've seen people come to with the increased turnout, with the youth vote? Does this favor one party or the other? You know, uh, experts generally will say that the youth vote uh, in this case will likely favor Biden. Um, but, you know, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, when it comes to Texas, we're seeing a lot of turnout in a lot of counties. But some of the counties we're seeing that big turnout in are actually traditionally Republican counties like Tarrant County, uh, like Collin County. And so what I'm interested in seeing um, is if this youth vote that's supposed to be as, as big as they're saying it is, it, is it going to be enough to really switch, you know, to, to flip some of these counties, to flip some some of these um, congressional districts? And I think moreover, what I'm looking for is the down ballot impact uh, of this increase in voting, especially from the youth. Uh, it's hard to believe, but the Texas House is only nine, uh, nine seats away from flipping to Democrats. And so that's something else I'm really interested in seeing. Um, th these youth votes can definitely change the result of a race. Uh, it's just not exactly clear who they're supporting, uh, especially in Texas. But I'm interested to see, again, not the impact just on the presidential election, but down the ballot all the way. And that's so important to mention. It's not just the big race at the top, a lot of those down ballot races as well, plus the tax propositions that San Antonio voters yep. are going to decide on, which will have a direct impact uh, to all of us here in San Antonio. You can find all of that information as well as that procrastinators voter guide on our website right now at ksat.com. Farah Sabawi, our own digital journalist, it's nice to see you and thanks so much for weighing in. Have me back on anytime, you guys. Well, you, I'm actually, you're invited to come into the basement, the virtual basement <laughs> with us on election night. We'll talk about numbers. Steve, I'll be there. All right. It's a good deal. All right. Ferris, appreciate your time. We'll be right back. With only one week now until Election Day, President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden are on aggressive campaign schedules in an attempt to win every last bit of support. More than 66 million voters have already cast their ballots in this election, but the political fight for the White House is far from over. ABC's Faith Abube is in Washington with the very latest. Former Vice President Joe Biden spending an entire day in Georgia, a state no Democrat has won in nearly 30 years. I know we can unite and heal this nation. The state is one of six battlegrounds Biden is expected to campaign in this week. In an effort to flip votes, President Trump won in 2016. President Trump also hitting the campaign trail hard, planning to stump in nearly a dozen states this week. We're going to have a great red wave people that want to go out and vote, vote. With 11 rallies scheduled in the final 48 hours before Election Day. In the final days before Election Day, dueling campaign ads hitting the airwaves. The Trump campaign with his 30-second spot. While America's cities burned, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris fanned the flames.
calling protesters against racial injustice rioters and claiming Biden and his running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, have abandoned police. In their closing message ads, Biden targeting Latino and black voters. This is Joe Biden. Black lives matter, period. While focusing on a message of unity. Together we can fix this. Back on the campaign trail, as coronavirus cases, deaths and hospitalizations surge across the country, Biden and his surrogates continue to hammer President Trump on his pandemic response. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. Trump defending himself before heading to his first campaign stop of the day. One of the things we've done a really good job on is COVID. We would have millions of people dead. According to PolitiFact, the millions of COVID-19 deaths Trump mentioned came from a warning about what would happen if the U.S. took absolutely no action against the virus. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. All right, so this is one of those things where be careful what you ask for, because we've been wanting cooler weather for a long time. Just maybe not this cool. This was a fast yeah. forward through the seasons. It really was. It feels like winter outside. In fact, we've had a lot of conversations today where people were like, hey, Sarah, can you bring back the warmer weather? I'm tired of the cold already. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to feel like fall over the next few days, so we don't have to worry about that. But. Outside right now, it is cold. It's 43 degrees in San Antonio, 36 in Kerrville in the Hill Country, 34 in Rock Springs. We've got another shot at some substantial rain chances tonight, and then we're going to see the sun tomorrow. But I'll be back to tell you that it'll still feel like fall. It won't get too warm over the next few days. So a little bit of something for everybody coming up in the full forecast. In the buzz today, Selena the series coming to Netflix December 4th, and a trailer is now out. It stars Christian Serratos of The Walking Dead as the Tejano singer. Also stars San Antonio's own Ricardo Chavira as right. Selena's father. Mm -hmm. The series chronicles the singer's life from her childhood here in Texas through her superstar career until her murder at the age of 23. The trailer suggests the series will explore her relationships with her family members as well as her musical career. Black Friday will look a little different at Home Depot this year. The Home Improvement Store has unveiled its Black Friday sales. Deals will start on November 6th and then continue through December 2nd this year. Home Depot not planning any big door busters. The company is keeping stores closed on Thanksgiving, like always. Doors will be back open on Black Friday. Other retailers like Walmart and Lowe's also starting their holiday sales early this year. It's in an effort to reduce crowds and control the spread of COVID-19. A lot of holiday sales going to look different. Yeah. Along with everything else. Yes. Bud Light Seltzer is getting into the holiday spirit with three new festive flavors and designs. They're Apple Crisp, Peppermint Patty, that one's interesting, <laughs> and Ginger Snap. They're being bundled together into an ugly sweater variety pack with cranberry, which is an existing flavor. The 12 packs are available for a limited time. Hard Seltzer has been a success for the Bud Light brand since its launch in January. Anheuser-Busch InBev, which owns the Bud Light brand, said in its most recent earnings call that seltzer sales grew 600% for the quarter. Wow. I've yet to try a seltzer. I agree. The peppermint An alcoholic is seltzer, seltzer, let's put it that way. To say. I mean, I think the peppermint one is definitely going to be iffy. Does that sound weird? But... Also, I hear they taste a lot like just like sparkling water, so we'll see. We'll see. I'm how sure, I've tried them. Some are good. That's good to know. I might have to give it a shot. I don't know then. about the ugly sweater pack. I'll tell you what I do want. A cup of hot cocoa or some oh, coffee yeah. or something oh, yeah. like that because it is chilly outside. In fact, today, a record-breaking day here in San Antonio. I want to show you the high temperatures for the day. Not the current temperatures, the high temperatures. It only got up to 38 degrees in Kerrville, only got up to 34 in Rock Springs. Here in San Antonio, our high temperature was only 45 degrees. And by the way, that's really impressive because today's high of 45 is the coldest October high temperature day since 1925, almost 100 years. And so, yeah, that cold front that happened yesterday was a real deal cold front. Now, don't worry if you want to be a little bit warmer than today. We are going to see some sunshine tomorrow, but we'll probably spend the next I would say 12 to 18 hours with temperatures in the 40s out there. Right now, a familiar sight outside, just kind of uh, 
little icky out there <laughs> with drizzle outside and it's in the low 40s right now because of winds from the north at 15 miles per hour. We do have a wind chill. It feels like it's 36 in San Antonio. So if you have plans to go out tonight, make sure to bring the scarf and the heavier coat because it's definitely cold outside. It's 34 in Rock Springs, 30 six in Kerrville, 41 in Yavaldi, 46 in Gonzalez, 46 in LaGrange, and 42 in Austin. It's 69 in Houston. That's a warm spot out there. Uh, and they did have the front move through, but it just didn't have enough oomph to cool it down too much. Temperature is up in the panhandle in the 20s, 27 in Amarillo, 28 in Lubbock. It's it was actually in the teens there yesterday, so it's a little bit warmer than it was yesterday, but still very cold. And in fact, parts of Oklahoma got about an inch of ice, which is very heavy. Trees have snapped and things like that. But I just want to take a moment to appreciate how wacky the weather is in 2020 because we have got this snowstorm out there across parts of Texas. And meanwhile, we have a tropical storm in the Gulf of Mexico. Tropical storm Zeta, which is expected to strengthen once again to hurricane status and actually make landfall across eastern Louisiana, impact the New Orleans area, and then just stream up uh, across parts of the eastern United States, bringing a lot of rain. So tropical systems happen when it's really warm out there, and we're still dealing with some snow across parts of Texas. We are going to see our rain chances increase a little bit tonight, and the reason for that is this upper level low pressure system. We've had drizzle throughout the day, only 200 of an inch of rainfall recorded at the airport. But tonight we have the chance to see some more substantial light rain, maybe only amounting to about a tenth or two of an inch of rainfall, but still a little bit more hefty than what we've been seeing throughout the day today. That'll be gone though by mid morning and by mid morning we'll actually see clearing skies and it'll be totally sunny in the afternoon. Hurricane Zeta will actually bring us some drier air and that's why we'll have the sun pretty quickly. So tonight in San Antonio, just coasting at 43 degrees with scattered light rain uh, by midnight. It'll be breezy throughout the evening with gusts up to 25 miles per hour. And we'll wake up tomorrow generally in the low 40s and in the upper 30s across parts of the hill country. Totally sunny by noon, 66 degrees for the afternoon high. So it's going to feel pretty good outside and nice and dry as well. So dress in layers tomorrow. And over the next few days, honestly, that fall feeling will still stick around. We're going to have chilly mornings, comfortable afternoons with highs in the 70s and tons of sunshine. Halloween looks good. Don't forget, we fall back by Saturday morning. We get an extra hour of sleep, which I'm happy about too. So a lot to celebrate in the forecast there. Nice. All right. Thanks, Sarah. In case you missed it coming up next. Good morning. It's Tuesday, October 27th. Thanks for joining us. New this morning, San Antonio police looking for a suspect in a shooting and robbery. Police said the suspect broke in and shot the man living there in the hand. Victim ran off to call for help when officers showed up at the apartment. The shooter was gone. The victim was taken to hospital with injuries and is expected to recover. San Antonio police said between 24 and 27 people were arrested yesterday for blocking traffic, doing donuts in their cars, and violating traffic laws throughout the city. Police said they towed 12 cars involved in those large car gatherings. One gathering on Monday night had more than 100 cars there. Specially equipped aircraft with trained medical crews will fly critically ill patients out of El Paso to many of the major Texas cities now poised to accept patients from its overburdened intensive care units. The difference between a really busy, busy day in the ICU and being overwhelmed can sometimes just be two or three patients in your unit. So that's what we're trying to help them do right now. The Bear County Sheriff's Office recovering multiple stolen vehicles out of a suspected chop shop today. The deputies called out to the 10,600 block of Old Pearsall Road based on a tip of a possible stolen vehicle there. Sheriff Javier Salazar says what they found was $90,000 to $100,000 worth of stolen materials. Salazar says they believe the chop shop is part of a larger organization. <gasps> Well,
Remember how I said we would coast at 43? Well, we dipped down to 42 oh, here no. in San Antonio. So we'll coast at 42 for the rest of the evening. It's in the upper 30s, though, in the Hill Country. Wind chill makes it feel like it's in the 30s for us here in San Antonio. So 42 for the morning low tomorrow. Light rain overnight is possible, but will clear out, and it'll be 66 in the afternoon tomorrow and sunny. Sunny for the rest of the forecast period with chilly mornings and comfortable afternoons. Coasting and cold. This yeah. Morning. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10.